This material is made available to you by or on behalf of the University of Melbourne under Section 113P of the Copyright Act 1968. It may be subject to copyright. For more information, visit the University Copyright website. Well, I guess I don't really know what the protocol is here, but I don't think I can, I can sit here watching Nick looking like a poker face athlete for much longer. Um, so I may as well do an introduction. I wasn't expecting to, so it's off very much off the cuff. But uh, Nicholas started as a um, resident at the uh, University of Melbourne. Was it been twelve months, Nick? Yeah, yeah, that's right. January. About twelve months. About twelve months ago now, um, and this sort of research project has been in the evolution since that time. And Nicholas has. Uh, faced uh, some challenges over that time, including uh, his then supervisor, which was moi, leaving the university. Uh, also, obviously, the changes to university. I don't know if I'm glad to speak about those, but um, and uh, as well as uh, facing some considerable personal challenges. And despite all those things, he has uh, stayed on, on track uh, and is progressing well with his project and I guess that's why we're here today to hear about um, uh, what he's doing and it's it's um, yeah it's a real honor for me to introduce Nick he's a um, I think he's a shining light of the future of of um, veterinary pathology so Nick I'll, I'll um, let you get to it all right <clears throat> Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, that's very nice words to hear. Okay, um, well, we may as well get started. Um, so, Wamenjika, uh, I acknowledge the traditional owners on the land on which I work and pay my respects to the elders, past and present. Um, today, I will be talking about my research project, the equine fetal membranes, what is normal? Now, before we talk about the fetal membranes, uh, let me introduce the Australian thoroughbred breeding industry. Um, the, the industry generates an estimated $1.16 billion annually to the national economy. Um, annual expenditure is about $934 million annually. Um, and of this, about uh, $490.6 million is spent on horse production um, every year, which uh, accounts for about 13,000 foalings every year. Now, out of these 13,000 foals that are born per year, um, about 5%, possibly more, um, are lost from abortions each season. That's an estimated $24.5 million in financial loss from equine fetal loss alone. Uh, in addition, there is increased exposure of horses and humans to health and safety risks. Uh, to this point, AgriFutures Australia is prioritizing projects to improve breeding outcomes and fall health and development. It is through this demand for research that my project focuses on investigating the equine fetal membranes. So now let's introduce the fetal membranes. Um, all mammalian fetal membranes have the following four components, the chorion, uh, the yolk sac, allantois, and the amnion. And together, they optimize protection, nutrient transfer, and waste exchange of the embryos, uh, thus increasing uh, the chances of their survival. Uh, between species, uh, the organization and development of these membranes can vary or change. Um, the carnivores, for example, they have a zonal placenta with the endometrial labyrinth forming an equatorial band around the chorionic sac. Uh, ruminants have a cotyledonary placenta whereby the chorionic villi bunch together, uh, forming multiple discrete discs called cotyledons. 
uh, for maternal exchange. Uh, primates, rodents, and legomorphs uh, have a discoid placenta with a focal or bifocal collection of villi or labyrinths uh, grouped together in clusters uh, separated by uterine septa. Now, the fetal membranes in the horse is, is unique uh, in that it is, uh, it's very different from the rest. It is diffuse, uh, epitheliochorial, and microcotyledonary. Big words, but basically that means it conforms to the shape of the mare's bipartite uterus. Uh, the chorion opposes an intact maternal uterine epithelium, uh, creating a total of six layers of tissue that separate the maternal circulation from the fetal circulation. Uh, and, and the endometrial surface is covered by this velvet lush red carpet of thousands of tiny cotyledons actively providing nutrition and waste exchange uh, to the developing fetus. Uh, the image on the top left uh, shows the fetal membrane uh, with the chorionic or maternal side uh, being displayed. That's why it's very red. And when you flip it over, um, the fetal membranes inside out, the image on the right uh, shows the fetal membranes with the allantoic or the fetal side uh, being displayed. The allantochorion, or sometimes known as the chorioallantois, also known as the placenta, uh, it contacts the maternal endometrium. Uh, it connects to the fetus via the umbilical cord. And the fetus itself is enveloped by a second more intimate membrane uh, known as the, uh, the allantoamnion or amnion as everyone calls it. Um, other miscellaneous components of the fetal membranes include the yolk sac remnant, uh, which you can see in the top, uh, the hippomanes and the endometrial cups. When the fetal membranes fail to function normally, this may result in abortions or equine fetal loss. Equine fetal loss or equine abortion uh, occurs from insults to the fetal membranes from a variety of causes. We classify it broadly as uh, non-infectious and infectious causes. Non-infectious abortions arise from predominantly physical or genetic uh, etiologies. These include things like winning, uh, umbilical cord torsion, uh, or fetal developmental abnormalities. Uh, infectious abortions are caused by infectious agents such as bacteria, viruses, and fungi. So this table here uh, shows the proportion of causes of abortion at the New South Wales Hunter Valley Equine Hospital in Australia uh, from between the years 2005 uh, to 2012. And if we look at causes of abortion from uh, bacterial infections, in particular uh, EAFL, also known as equine amnionitis and fetal loss, uh, as well as uh, your classic placentitis, they both form large proportions of causes of equine abortion. And in 2011, uh, they collectively accounted for about 48% of the equine abortion, abortions that year. In bacterial placentitis, the target tissue for infection uh, is typically the allantochorion uh, first. As it succumbs, the fetal development becomes disrupted. We then end up with abortions, premature births, or the delivery of compromised sick foals. Uh, these two images on the left are of the normal fetal membranes, both the arthroic side and the chorionic side, just for reference. Now, when we grossly examine an abnormal fetal membrane, lesions associated with bacterial placentitis can be observed. Down here, the normal red velvet chorionic surface um, is discolored brown and appears very mucoid. Um, this part of the allantochorion, it's got a name, it's called the cervical star region. Uh, it opposes the cervix and it is 
probably the closest uh, part of the fetal membranes to the external reproductive tract. Uh, it is likely that this infection ascended through the cervix, causing this very classic appearance. Now, this is a different type of, a different presentation of placentitis uh, caused by uh, nocardioform uh, bacteria. Um, there is a focal mucoid discoloration present between the horns instead of the cervical region. Bacterial infection of the fetal membranes, as you can see, uh, can affect other parts uh, and vary in their gross appearance. Now, this is the question. What is normal? There is a range of appearances of the fetal membranes from normal folding at the gross microscopic and microbiological level. For example, it is not uncommon for normal foldings or normal folds to be delivered to be delivered with the fetal membranes appearing to have gross abnormalities. The difficulty lies in assessing the significance of these lesions uh, in the context of an accompanying seemingly healthy fold. Whether this is normal or part of a pathological process that remains undetermined. During microscopic or histological examination of the fetal membranes from normal foldings, a range of microscopic changes can also be present. For example, uh, infiltration, vac vacuolization, uh, atrophy, uh, affecting the cells of the alpha-chorion are not uncommon findings in the context of a normal folding. This is a photomicrograph of an allotocorion um, that accompanied a normal folding. There is hypercellular changes, uh, possibly some changes to the cellular architecture. Uh, but however, we, can't, we cannot assess the significance of these lesions in the context of a normal folding as the spectrum of what is normal is unknown. Could there be a association with a pathologic process or is this a normal finding? When microbiology is performed on normal fetal membranes, um, bacterial isolates were detected. Uh, yet the significance of these isolates remain unknown because again, a spectrum of what is normal has not yet been established. Do the presence of certain bacteria indicate pathology in a normal folding, or are they not part of the normal placental uh, microbiome? Uh, as a significant component to, the, uh, to a major equine industry, uh, there are very few papers devoted to the study of changes in the normal equine fetal membranes. The, the amount of research into this is very limited and more needs to be done. Which brings us to our research hypothesis and aims. We hypothesize that these gross and microscopic changes present on the fetal membranes and normal foldings uh, exist uh, within a spectrum of normal changes. Our first research aim is to describe and record any observed gross and microscopic changes of the fetal membranes in normal foldings. Uh, and our second research aim is to investigate the normal uh, equine fetal microbiome using molecular diagnostics to establish a range of normal flora. As part of my method, during the 2023 and 2024 breeding seasons, uh, I will travel to various thoroughbred breeding stud farms in New South Wales and Victoria uh, for field work to collect samples. First, we obtain a mere medical history. And then at the time of falling, we will collect sterile allotoamniotic membranes and amniotic fluid samples uh, for microbiome analysis. Uh, after parturition, I will then grossly examine the fetal membranes. Then I will collect the fetal membrane samples from 
uh, the location according to figure one, and then store them in 10% neutral buffer formalin for fixation. Um, after falling, I will obtain a medical history of the fall just to ensure that it is a medically normal fall. I will then send uh, the sterile samples to my supervisor, Professor James Gilkerson in Parkville uh, for microbiome analysis. Um, I will then have the formalin fixed samples processed through the Veterinary Histology Laboratory Service on site here in Werribee. Uh, after processing the sections, I will then examine uh, these under the microscope and describe and record any histological changes. We will then put together the gross the histologic and the microbiome data for analysis. Using this data, we hope to find any correlations between gross and histologic changes, uh, and also hopefully find any correlations between uh, aberrations in the microbiome uh, with also any gross and histologic changes. This is the project timeline. Uh, we are currently in March of 2023. Uh, analysis of the samples will take place between, um, oh, sorry, field, field work will be performed in uh, August. To September. Uh, analysis of the samples will take place between November and December. Uh, if necessary, I may do additional field work in the 2024 uh, falling season. And the aim is to complete the project by July of 2025. This is the expected budget breakdown for the project. Uh, any additional shortfall will be addressed through external funding application uh, through equine research grants. Uh, so in summary, I will collect fresh and fixed fetal membrane tissues and fresh amniotic fluid. Uh, I'll then grossly examine, describe, document the fetal membranes that accompany live viable foals. Then I will microscopically analyze the formalin fixed fetal membrane tissues, describe any histological changes that I have observed, and then use metagenomic analysis to investigate the range of the placental microbiome uh, and perhaps correlate these with findings uh, with the presence of fetal membrane lesions. And all of this, the end goal is to further the current information on what is normal in the equine fetal membranes. <clears throat> that brings me to the end of my presentation. I would like to thank my project supervisors who continue to support and guide my research project. Uh, here are my references for this talk. Do we have any questions? Nick, can you hear me? Yep. Great talk, Nick. Um, really thorough presentation. Um, very impressed with that. Well done. Uh, my question, I haven't been to a following for a lot of years, um, but I'm just wondering, how it is that you plan to collect a sterile amniotic fluid sample during that process? My recollection is that it can be pretty quick sometimes. Yeah, that's that's a really good question. Um, hopefully I can do it with the horse's permission. <laughs> yeah, so um, you're right. It is, uh, it, is, uh, it is something that happens very, very quickly um, uh, um, with, with the foldings. Um, if I refer you to one of the pictures that we've seen earlier where we have the mare lying on the side with um, the, the falling about to occur, and you have a, a nice bag of, um, of, of fluid, that's the, that's the amniotic uh, fluid within the, the amnion. Um, Hopefully, in that short amount of time, uh, the plan is to put some uh, put some ethanol over the membranes um, 
and, and go in with a syringe and needle and draw uh, fluid. Um, that being said, though, I am also open to other possibilities. I have thought of perhaps maybe clamping off a tiny little bubble of the, the amnion. So I've got not only the amniotic fluid, um, you know, um, um, in a safe spot, but I've also got a, a piece of the amnion as well. Perhaps that can also be used um, for microbiome analysis. Um, it will be a bit of a work in progress and, and it's a learn as I go kind of thing, but that, that's that's what we have planned for collecting sterile amniotic fluid. Nice. And uh, you should be you should be grateful to Kalen because he's training you to stay up at night because that's when you'll be getting all the samples. Absolutely. That's right. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, at least, at least the, just the practicalities here, I think um, uh, Joan uh, Carrick is one of the external supervisors and, and working with uh, James Gilkerson as well. So he'll be up there and the idea is he'll be working with the foal attendant. So hopefully, you know, more or less on site and ready to go. So hopefully be there in time to catch the rather quick event before the rather quick event happens or whilst it's happening. Um, sorry, just, just jumping in. I think it will be fine because usually while they break and the fluids come out very quickly, the, there's always a bit of fluid, like like a puddle that's kind of on the bottom of the membranes. And so that wouldn't be really contaminated if you go in. I mean, even if it breaks and the mare's on her side and starts pushing, then I don't think she cares too much if you go in and just take a syringe and, and pull some out. It's probably even easier when at that stage, when she's already on her side pushing, she's less likely to kind of jump up again or something. Then, you know what I mean? So... Once it's broken, there's the like dorsally, there's always kind of a collection of fluid in the membranes. That's right. And also, Monique and, and, and Natalie, um, the other thing is that um, whatever comes out of the microbiome analysis will be, uh, you know, not taken as uh, gospel, but examined in, in context. So if you have any obvious contaminants uh, that are present commonly in the soil, um, they will be, you know, uh, interpreted in context. And um, you will also have, a, I think, the safety numbers in that you know, the number of samples you will collect uh, will help you um, um, help you determine what is background um, noise. Yeah, I think as long as you take some negative controls and then that, that should help. Yep. Nick, th there is a question in the chat, Nick, just about um, whether you, you're going to consider collecting samples from dystochia cases and or animals with previous history of abortion or stillbirth. Uh, yes, I, I, I think um, that, that's a good question. I think that's, that, that is relevant. Um, I, will, I will get that information from, um, from the mayor's history, of course. The aim of setting of, of going up during the September falling season is so that I can try and collect as many samples from normal fallings as possible. Um, I suppose if, if I were to collect samples from abortions, usually these tend to occur in um, July, um, just before the falling season, because obviously most of these uh, abortion cases uh, occur before the falling season, before when the fall is meant to be due. Uh, but certainly, it, yes, um, I, will, uh, it, 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 I will undoubtedly end up having to collect uh, samples from uh, from, from mares that have had previous um, abortions or dystopia. And it's also then, therefore, it becomes important to have that mare history in order to put the findings in, in context and draw conclusions from them. To be honest, I think just collect whatever you can get your hands on. It's so hard to get <laughs> samples from horses. Yep. So um, even if it's for a future project, even if you don't have enough numbers, because you never know how many, what your numbers are going to be. I mean, you might be getting five or something and can you make your own group? Otherwise just keep them in the freezer for the next students. Those samples are gold, really. They're so hard to obtain. So just get whatever you can collect. 
Absolutely, that's right. Yeah. Great, great talk, Nick. I was just wondering, um, have you thought about, you know, for this project, how many samples you are planning to collect? And also, um, you know, is it is it's the first one or the, you know, a subsequent um, a falling, will that affect the placenta? I'm not sure. So are you going to keep an eye on like, you know, what number of falling the mayor is having? And also another small question, you know, I have noticed that you have talking about some immunohistochemistry on these samples. How have you thought about what you are planning to do with these uh, samples, you know, what markers you are planning to use uh, to further investigate the placenta? Yeah, thanks very much for the question. Um, so a number of placental samples that I intend to collect, um, I'm trying to aim for about 50 or 60 if I can. Uh, but as Natalie uh, had mentioned before, I'm just going to try and collect as many as I can. Um, yeah, the and, and the second question with regards to the mare parity. Uh, yes, so again, that is something that we often obtain with the mare history. Um, and it, perhaps it may, it may or it may not influence um, the examination or, or the findings from the examination of the, of the placenta or the fetal membranes. Um, but it's important to get that information. So therefore, when we obtain the mare history, we usually will obtain the parity number, and that hopefully should be able to interpret the results in context. Um, finally, that question with regards to the immunohistochemistry, um, I suppose at this stage, I don't have any markers that I'm intending to use at the moment. Um, however, perhaps as the project unfolds, uh, perhaps um, I, I, can, I, I may then, I may then um, find uh, a particular immunohistochemistry marker that, that may be useful in, in, um, in, in looking for uh, or making observations with my histological samples. Thanks, Nick. Uh, has anyone else got any um, queries, questions? Joe's got one in the chat. Um, Rich? Thanks. Uh, I think any contamination or similar that Nick might get when collecting samples from normal foaling slash tissues will be similar to what is encountered in future studies where samples are collected from abortion, stillbirths or similar, so they would still serve as good control samples. I so can I can ask in real oh, life. Oh, good on you, Joe. Yeah. Good on you. Hello. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. I just typing it out. But yeah, I just thought, you know, there's also a danger in being like too, you know, not a danger, but if you're too clean and too sterile, people in future studies can't necessarily replicate that. So if you get a little bit of contamination for your normal tissues, and then in the future you're trying to compare it to like a stillbirth or similar and trying to work out what's going on. It's almost better in a real world context that they're, you know, they're not collected in some kind of way that's never repeatable in the future. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think it's okay to have a bit of contamination if that's likely to occur in the in future sample collection too. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think uh, it, it's important to understand that um, things that happen in the laboratory or in a petri dish is, you know, can be very, very different from things that happen in, in real life. Um, that being said, I think it's still also important to uh, understand, I think uh, the aim here is to actually um, 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 investigate the spectrum of, of what, is, what is normal. So um, as, as much as possible, I will still try and be, uh, collect, you know, collect samples as cleanly as possible. I think at the end of the day, we want to have a good idea of what is going on within, uh, within, what, within the uterus. And so mm -hmm. if we are able to collect a nice sterile sample, then that, that helps us find out what is what is going on inside the uterus. I think that, that is the primary question that we're trying to, to figure out. What, what is happening inside the uterus? What is what is normal for what is happening inside the uterus before the pole comes out? Um, and, and then perhaps maybe in subsequent uh, uh, research, uh, research studies, we, we may look at maybe collecting uh, samples uh, less uh, or more aseptic, uh, yeah, uh, less aseptically, I guess, just just to get a real world idea. Yeah, I just because I remember when we were doing our study and we tried to do compare normal and um, you know samples from aborted um, equine fetuses, it was a little hard because um, 
they weren't necessarily comparing apples and apples, sort of apples and oranges. So in the future, you know, when someone's trying to do an investigation, but they've only got nice sterile clean samples to compare their microbiome in from uh, or with from an aborted sample, it just gets, um, it's just another layer of things to think about, I guess. And it sounds like you're doing a really good job of thinking through that in advance. So yeah, that's great. Thank you. And that's a great fallback, Nick. If you fall over and drop one in the manure, you can just say that's one for Joe. Yeah, so, yeah. Which I, um, I'm fairly certain will, will happen at least. <laughs> has, has anyone else got any more questions? I just wanted to ask if it's possible to get um, like a swap from the mayor. I mean, that would be good, like right after. But I guess we would have to apply for ethics now because it's more than just scavenging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll have to get the mass permission as well. Yeah, that's I mean, it. Should be all right. It's it's um it's that's a good a point to do it because they're probably just lying there. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, I, I, we just have to discuss it maybe next, uh, tomorrow or something if if that's something we should put in if that's helpful. Yeah, because then you can compare the inside of the mare to the uh, to the amniotic fluid, for example. Good point. All right, Nicholas, well done. Thank you, um, and thanks everyone for coming on. And um, I suppose until your next seminar, Nick. That's right. Thank you very much. All right. Well done, mate. Thanks, everyone. You're